the duration of his Chinese slowdown is jaw-dropping. Ian Shepherdson models out 24 months, it's 3 and 5%, make it 4% China GDP. What does that do, Ian, to the labor mandate that Beijing needs and has? Yeah, it's a problem. I mean, we just cut our China forecast. We just don't see any bottom yet to the real estate disaster. Prices falling, volumes falling. Uh, no sign of a fix coming through. And it's a huge chunk of the economy. It's been a big engine of growth for the, the last couple of decades. Uh, and it has not found a flaw yet. So it's going to put real pressure on the labor market, real pressure on the authorities. And I think the bottom line is that there'll have to be some substantial policy action from the center, from Beijing, right. because the local authorities who effectively right now are being tasked with dealing with this mess just don't have the resources. So the central <coughs> government, which is resisting, uh, eventually is going to have to fold, is going to have to step in with a lot of public money uh, and, try and try and put a floor under the, under the problem. Because if they don't, they're going to find a, a, an economy that is mm -hmm. way, way weaker than they want for a very extended period. And that's a threat. That's a real threat to them. It's all a threat to the global economy as well, because obviously China is such a big right. part of global growth, especially uh, through the manufacturing sector. In the ambiguities of inflation, Ian Shepardson, do they export disinflation and deflation, thus making some of the inflation fear calls of the West maybe overwrought? Yeah, at the margin. I mean, you know, Ch Chinese inflation, PPI inflation, which passes through into Europe and into the US, you know, is really rolling over now. No question about that. But I think it's important to appreciate that the bulk of the inflation shock in the US especially, but, but also in Europe, um, apart from energy, in the core has been through margin expansion uh, uh, you know, in, in the retail services sector. So uh, that's not really China contingent. That's really been more a story of, of booming consumer spending against constrained supply. But you know, right now, central banks everywhere will take anything they can get. And if a, you know, the slowdown in inflation in China gives them a little bit of room for maneuver, that, that's great. But it's not going to be the heart of the, of the disinflation story in the US over the next year. And of course, Europe is still struggling with the, the energy inflation shock, which is much bigger uh, and is likely to be much more persistent. So we've still got some really big problems. Well, let's talk about UK's whaler. And I don't own the rights to that one. Ian, how bad are things going to get in the UK and across <laughs> Europe for that matter too? <laughs> well, Europe's in recession now already. I mean, that, that's, that's pretty obvious now. We see that lasting for a while. Uh, ECB is still going to hike because, you know, the... Uh, the German influence on the anti-inflation story is very intense, so we're going to get at 50 bips at the next meeting. <coughs> UK is different. I mean, I think there's a reasonable chance that inflation, sorry, recession can be averted, but only if the new prime minister, who presumably will be Liz Truss in two weeks' time, uh, takes some more drastic action to bail out households from the energy price shock. So you now that isn't a promise right now. It's a forecast, and you know I could be wrong. They might not do it, which would be crazy given the pressure the households are under, and that probably would mean the UK would end up in recession later this year. But right now, I kind of think the politics points them towards doing something more aggressive, effectively handing households more money, and with a bit of luck, uh, that will allow the the consumer sector to just tick over through the second half of the year and prevent a recession. But it's going to be a close run thing. And of course, the Bank of England is still going to be raising rates. So there's a real squeeze going on there, which is unlikely to abate anytime soon. So you know, just avoiding recession, that's not the same as a forecast of everything being OK. It, it isn't. And it isn't going to be OK for the foreseeable future in the UK. Uh, because you know, even if the energy price thing goes away, you've still got the lingering catastrophe that is Brexit dragging the whole economy down, uh, for, essentially for the foreseeable future. Ian, it's a low bar looking across Europe. Just how low is the bar in Europe? Can they avoid recession? Well, they've got one now. Uh, it's uh, it's probably not going to be very deep or very long, though that does depend to some extent on what happens to energy prices. But uh, but they're in 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 recession already. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I, it, a turnaround probably will come at some point next year, but we've got to get through the worst of it first. So things are a real mess. There's no growth momentum anywhere uh, in Europe. The only place where I can see any growth momentum coming through before the end of the year is probably in the U.S. And even there, it's going to be patchy because the housing market's a catastrophe. Manufacturing is under pressure uh, from the businesses being nervous about energy prices. But it's nowhere near as bad as it is in Europe. And I think that the U.S. is going to avoid recession quite comfortably, which, of course, is why markets are getting nervous, because they're now thinking, well, you know, the U.S. isn't going to move into recession uh, and the Fed is not yet talking dovishly. So we've seen this upward pressure on yields again. 
Ian, you're making me sound rosy. I'm thinking about this. Housing is a catastrophe. Nothing is positive in Europe. At what point has this been priced in already? And at what point is this uh, something that requires a much broader and more drastic repricing of risk assets across the board? Well, that's a good question. I think a lot of this is is priced in. I mean, if you if you're not expecting a recession in in, in Europe now, you you probably haven't been paying attention. So I think that that story is pretty well understood now. Uh, the question is, you know, what what do we get out of it? I mean, the the problem, the fundamental problem for Europe is that the rise in energy prices has made everyone in Europe poorer. There's no way to avoid that. You know, it's, it's cutting interest rates or pushing money into people's pockets through fiscal policy is just delaying the inevitable and hiding the truth, which is that an energy price shock in an energy consuming region makes everyone poorer uh, and makes the economy weaker and hits corporate earnings and there's just no way to avoid this. You can work through it, you can ameliorate some of the worst impacts of it, but you can't get away from the fundamental fact that if you're an energy user and energy prices go up, you're poorer. Uh, and this is much worse in continental Europe than it is in the UK and it's uh, it's, uh, it's much less bad in the US and it, gas prices are now falling very sharply. But Europe's at the front and center of this because of Ukraine uh, and because of their energy policy over the last 20 years and they're gonna be paying for it for a long time. And so risk assets in this environment, you know, it, it's, it's, very di it's very difficult and it's probably not gonna be a very quick turnaround. Ian, when we talk about the United States and how it's in a better situation, a lot of the notes that I've been reading have been talking about the inventory glut that a lot of uh, analysts are expecting at companies, including uh, big retailers, that have ordered too much stuff and that this will be disinflationary heading into year end. How much will this be a disinflationary force? How much will this take some of the pressure off the Fed? Yeah, this is the thing I'm, I'm watching more closely than pretty much anything else, because when we had the inventory shortages last year, what we saw was a gigantic widening of retailers' margins, because effectively people were bidding for whatever inventory they could find, especially uh, in, in the vehicle market where, where retail dealers' margins tripled. I mean, that, that's an official number. Retail auto dealers' margins tripled across last year. Now that leaves them at a ridiculously overextended level. So now that auto production is rising because the chips are available again, and now that we've had all this retail inventory arriving on boats over the last six months or so, we are in a position now where that, that, that enormous margin expansion should reverse. And it could easily take two, three, even four percentage points off of core inflation over the course of the next 12 months. Now, it kind of surprises me that the Fed isn't talking about this. I'm sure they know it's going to happen, but, but this margin expansion and contraction story to me has been the big driver of inflation on the upside and will be the big driver of inflation on the downside. Of course, the problem is, you know, for, for an investor in, in, uh, in, in the consumer sphere, you're looking at retailers, Target, Walmart, we've heard all about them, <coughs> facing a margin squeeze at really quite substantial proportions uh, over the course of the next year. But, uh, you know, again, this, from the Fed's perspective, this is, this is good news because this is what we need to renormalize inflation to get margins back to something that's recognizably normal. It's a long way off, but the, the return of inventory uh, and the excess of inventory is what's going to bring about that margin compression and drive inflation down a long way.